<clears throat> Today uh, in uh, Israel, in the state of Israel, is the official day of commemoration for the deaths of the soldiers and other um, Israelis who fell in the course of the line of the many, of course of the lines and the many battles which Israel has fought since its uh, since before actually its uh, independence from the time of the rebellions against the Turks, the rebellions against the British. And then, of course, well, the people who were fighting against um, the uh, Germans in World War II. And then you have, of course, all of the Israeli soldiers and victims of terrorist attacks, all of who fell during the course of the years, over the past 150 years or so. So I figured today we'd be a little bit more, uh, um, I guess, serious than we usually are. Although, um, uh, we will start with something on a, a bit of a lighter note. I'd like to play for you first a, a video which has some aspects of Teddy Roosevelt's personality discussed. And then after that, we'll come back to um, the main topic of the day, which is Teddy Roosevelt and the pogrom of 1903 in Kishinev. After you watch this, during this video, please take down the personality traits of Theodore Roosevelt as they are depicted as uh, they emerge from that video. I wonder how a man so thick-set, of rather abdominal contour, with eyes heavily spectacled, could have so much an air of magic and wild romance about him, could give one so stirring an impression of adventure and chivalry. The Metropolitan Magazine. Fueled by cup after cup of coffee, served to him in a special mug his eldest son said was as big as a bathtub, Theodore Roosevelt raced through his day. Letters were answered upon receipt, a lifetime total of 150,000, dictated to shifts of weary stenographers. Jefferson wrote 22,000 letters, and we regard him as one of the great correspondents in American history. Roosevelt wrote at least 150,000 letters. And he's the writingest president in American history, by far and a number of his books are American classics. So he's an intellectual. He read a book a day, sometimes three books in a day when he had some leisure. You think of Jefferson as America's Renaissance man, but it's really Roosevelt. He would not stop talking. He was a one-man gas bag. But it was so interesting that most people didn't mind. One of my favorite stories is when he heard that there was a famous big game hunter in Washington. And he said to some of the people on the staff, get that man over here, I'd really like to meet him. So this big strapping English fellow was taken into the president's office and the door was closed and people outside the office heard this talking going on. Finally, the man emerged about an hour and a half later looking just beat down to, as though he'd been through a storm. And one of the president's staff said, what did you tell the president? He said, I told him my name. <laughs> we love him because of the energy. His laugh was infectious. His son Ted said, my father had a dozen eggs for breakfast every morning. So he's a large man and he's larger than life. Roosevelt once said, there's nothing quite so exhilarating as being thrown over the shoulders of a 300 pound Japanese man. He played all these wild games in the White House. He wrestled with diplomats. He played a game called single stick with Leonard Wood in which they would wrap themselves up in cushions and then beat the living daylights out of each other with sticks until Roosevelt had to stop. He boxed with a young aide too, until a blow caused him to lose vision in his left eye. Accordingly, I thought it better to acknowledge that I had become an elderly man and would have to stop boxing, he remembered. I then took up jujitsu for a year or two. Photographers were forbidden to cover his daily tennis games because he thought voters considered tennis a rich man's pastime. But when a cameraman failed to capture his horse jumping over an obstacle, he was more than happy to make the jump again. 
Roosevelt bit me, the editor William Allen White said, and I went mad. Now that you've seen that video, you begin to understand that Teddy Roosevelt had a unique personality and therefore was able to uh, uh, see and to act in ways which presidents before him and even after him have not acted. And um, one of the things which President Roosevelt, what well, Teddy Roosevelt did, which was uh, very, very much appreciated by the Jewish community of America at the time, and for this you should look at um, the handouts while I am talking. I'm going to talk about the things which are in the handouts. Um, which uh, you should have downloaded from the Google Classroom. And uh, in the, the end that you see the petition which Teddy Roosevelt uh, had delivered from the American people mostly, basically, to the Russian uh, Tsar in protesting the, um, the, the, the pogrom in Kishinev in 1903. Kishinev is spelled on the sheet, so you don't need me to spell it for you. Now, um, the Kishinev massacre was about um, basically the, the murder of Jews in the city of Kishinev. There, for three days, the, there was a rampage, rampage, R A M P A G E, like it sounds, where there were mobs and mobs of people uh, killing uh, the uh, killing Jews in and the wounding Jews and destroying Jewish property in the town of Kishinev, which is uh, t today. In the, uh, 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 in the Crimea, uh, part of Russia, and uh, they were going at this in a horrific way which the world had never really been able to perceive before. Now, until now, pogroms took place at a very big, large, a very far distance without any records, uh, uh, photographic records, or um, uh, certainly, even, certainly not movie records. But now, things are different. Photography was, was uh, well established. Uh, movies are being taken left and right. T Teddy Roosevelt was really the first um, uh, movie president because movies became really, really popular during his presidency. Uh, no, it's not with sound, but movies, with moving pictures, not talkies. Talkies only came much later. But uh, uh, this now people were able to find out in real time with, through telephone and telegraph and, and with real shocking pictures what was happening across, halfway across the globe. So therefore, this time, the American public knew very much what was happening and was horrified by the 49 Jews which were murdered and the hundreds which, and the hundreds which were killed. So in 19, uh, he, uh, there was, so he uh, agreed to the writing up of this petition, and this petition was supposed to be sent to the Russian authorities. As you see in the handout, they refused to receive it, and therefore it is still lodged in the, the State Department of the United States. But this is a revolutionary thing, and the language of the petition reflected that, in that from t till this point, most countries didn't get involved in other countries' matters. If they wanted to conquer territory from the other country, they conquered it, and then they ruled it as they pleased. But to go ahead and protest how another government treated its own citizens or its own subjects, this is something which was not done. Every government was the government of its people, and it was it how it dealt with people was its business, which is exactly what Russia claimed under the czars. So therefore, this was revolutionary in that the United States asserted that it had a right and a responsibility to protest religious persecution across the globe. That that's really part of what we spoke about before uh, with the the, Mar the Monroe Doctrine manifest destiny, the Roosevelt Corollary, that America has a special destiny destiny to lead the world and to be, although it's hard to see it nowadays, a moral and ethical influence on the world as well. So uh, Teddy Roosevelt and his administration through this petition, they didn't accomplish that uh, they got to the czar, but they accomplished that from now on, it was a given that at least the United States and subsequently other countries as well would interfere in the religious uh, freedoms of other countries. And uh, I, uh, there's another short video, which, which you're going to see in a moment, few moments, in which it is, um, th th there's a description of the history of American involvement with uh, religious freedom in other countries, culminating with the Jackson Amendment, which I still remember from my own youth because I'm very old, uh, when, the, uh, uh, when the Senator Jackson uh, made a special amendment to one of the laws of the United States that, uh, oh, I should self an amendment. A 
amendment. A M E N D M E N T. It's when you add something onto a law. Okay, so which and the Zaxon Amendment said that Russia. It didn't mention Russia by name, but it was it was the idea that everybody knew it was about Russia. Uh, any country which did not f allow uh, its citizens to freely emigrate, leave the country, if they felt that they, they were being religiously uh, persecuted in some way, shape, or form, uh, if they didn't let the, the people go, they would not be allowed to f trade with the United States on most favored nation status. Now, most favored nation status still exists, and almost every country in the world is most favored na nation. Most favored nation means you have certain uh, uh, easy ways of, uh, of dealing with the United States, importing, exporting, it's fast track. And most favored nation really means standard. If you know most favored nation, you're way below standard. And it means that the United States is going to treat you very, very poorly in you are being allowed to market your goods or purchase goods in the United States. And uh, that was uh, uh, the Senator Jackson's contribution to try and affect the uh, release of Russian Jews from Russia or they could be able to emigrate to Israel. <coughs> Getting back to Teddy Roosevelt and Kishinev. Uh, it, it, uh, Teddy Roosevelt at that time said, it doesn't matter what the religious persecution is, whether it's Christians or Jews. He didn't mention other religions because this wasn't, I assume because it wasn't in his head at the time. It makes no difference who's persecuted. The United States stands against such persecution. And uh, this is really was, it was only possible for the first time in the Roosevelt, not just because of his personality, but because of his his willingness to uh, wield that, to, to uh, twirl that big stick overseas as well, that he was able to have this kind of influence. And uh, this, uh, in this hand that you will have, you have this cartoon from, uh, it's from 1905, but it's a beautiful, beautiful cartoon. If you enlarge it, it's really stunning. Uh, uh, where um, uh, Teddy, Rose, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, I think I'm better, better uh, uh, Mario will send along a better, a more clear um, representation. I think I have a better one. But in any event, uh, I'll, I'll check, which is, is more clear. Um, so the, uh, um, I'll, have to, I'll have to look. Oh yeah, here it is. Okay, so I have it. So the, uh, if you, uh, uh, really, Teddy Roosevelt is standing over the king is Tsar of Russia, and I think that's quite obvious that the American power of Teddy Roosevelt is being seen as superior to that of the Tsar of Russia. Roosevelt is standing and directing, and the Tsar is sitting, somewhat bewildered. And along the, and here are the Jews under the various different weights which are described here, and uh, they are the Teddy Roosevelt is telling them telling the Tsar and others what they're supposed to do. America is on the uprise. America has the power. Roosevelt has what he would call, uh, he did call, the bully pulpit. The role of Teddy Roosevelt, instead of using word, word today like, word like cool or fantastic or uh, uh, grand, grand, he would use the word bully, right? Oh, that's really bully. And uh, he called the, the United States uh, presidency a bully pulpit. A pulpit is where a rabbi speaks from, or a priest. Uh, um, one second. Uh, the, uh, the rabbi priest speaks from in a synagogue or a church. And a bully pulpit is one which is a great pulpit. In the way it's put in, um, in, uh, in Wikipedia, a bully pulpit is a conspicuous position. Conspicuous means it's, it's obvious. It provides the opportunity to speak out and to be listened to. The, curm, the term was coined by United States Theodore, uh, President Theodore Roosevelt who referred to his office as a bully pulpit, by which he meant a terrific platform from which to advocate an agenda. Advocate means to push, an agenda means a plan. Roosevelt used the word bully as, the, as an adjective, meaning su superb or wonderful, a more common usage at that time. So the uh, idea was <clears throat> that the, United, the presidency of the United States is the most <laughs> bulliest pulpit in the world. And if somebody the United States wants to make a... a um, United States wants to lead the world. It all it has to do is have a president make a pronouncement in the right way, with the right speech, and in the, and for an agenda which is meaningful. And it's still true to this day, regardless of who, whether the person in the office uses that the office in that manner or not. 
Now, as we, the Christian massacre is described in many places, and uh, it's pretty gruesome and gory. I don't want to get into it, and, but it's something which uh, changed the world for Jews as well. And for Jews as well, this is the first, the last time that they took a pogrom and did not fight. They started, tried to fight back without any success. But from then on, <coughs> there was a movement to equip Jews to fight back. Uh, not to rely on the Tsarist government or the authorities, but to fight back. That was one aspect of this. Another aspect of this is with Herzog. That wanted to get Jews desperately out of Russia. That's when he was about to accept Uganda. And that's when, uh, of course, he was uh, re uh, rejected by the arrest of the Zionists. And it meant, at this time, the really massive immigration, emigration from Russia, immigration to both the United States and, to a lesser extent, as Israel, began as Jews. So there is no hope in this land for us. <clears throat> and therefore, it was time to leave. So this Kishri massacre has uh, a ramifications which stretch to today. Okay, and we will stop here for today, and you will now watch that other video, uh, and please take notes on it as well. The United States has the most robust international religious freedom agenda in its foreign policy apparatus of any country on earth. Of all the sort of great, you know, military powers, we're the only one that has a dedicated office for international religious freedom. During the 19th century, that mostly meant uh, making sure Protestant missionaries had um, protection from persecution when they went to non-Christian countries around the world. And that started to change around the turn of the 20th century. Teddy Roosevelt uh, gave what is, uh, in diplomatic terms, the kind of first scolding in defense of religious minorities um, to, um, to Russia. They were persecuting the Jews. But then during the Cold War, it accelerated because there was this sort of great contest between the kind of Christian America and the atheist Soviet Union. And so protecting the rights of religious believers of, of all religious faiths became this kind of crucial um, pivot point uh, for the Cold War. President Eisenhower, for example, authorized the U.S. Navy to evacuate um, in cooperation with the French. Um, somewhere around 800,000 Vietnamese Catholics from North Vietnam um, when, in the 1950s when Vietnam was being partitioned because they knew that um, the communists who were officially atheists would be persecuting um, um, all religious minorities of any kind. In the 1970s, um, Henry Jackson, who was a senator from Washington, successfully passed a, 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 an amendment to the Trade Reform Act of 1974, which stipulated that no non-market economy could receive most favored nation trading status with the United States if it did not permit free and open emigration. It was written to um, compel Soviet Russia to allow Russian Jews to emigrate from, um, from Russia, which they had not been um, doing. That was kind of the first real human rights law of any kind. It actually precedes many of the other human rights laws that we normally think of. It's very easy for any particular individual to say, I want my religious faith to be protected, regardless of what that faith might be. If you can get them to at least acknowledge that um, in order to protect their faith, they need to respect the religious faith of others, and that can become a very um, quick and, and sort of easily recognizable starting point for democracy promotion, for example.